All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks uh, for joining us. Um, we're here to have a discussion about the impact of data and artificial intelligence and a lot of other really cool things that I am not smart enough to explain, but luckily my two panelists here are smart enough to explain these things. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, first, I'd like to um, introduce Lindsay Thornton, who is the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic uh, Committee uh, sport uh, psychotherapist. And psychophysiologist. Psycho see, thank you, psychophysiologist. Okay. See, this is what happens when you uh, put the least scientific person on the panel. <laughs> um, so Lindsay is here to offer her expertise, obviously, in this area. And then we have Phil Cheatham, who is the U.S. OCP. Is it now U.S. OPC? Oh. PC. Yeah, OPC. OPC, US Olympic o and Paralympic Committee. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. He's the director of sports technology. Um, and uh, we want to get started first, because uh, Phil, we have a video yes. in which um, you can tell us a little bit more about uh, what people are about to see and about some of the exciting uh, data possibilities um, that many of us will see unfold at the Olympics that have been unfolding. So why don't you go ahead and cue that up for us? Well, this is one of the technologies we're gonna talk about in our session today. And I thought it'd be nice just to give you an, uh, a video to give you an idea of what it's all about. We're using ra radar technology to measure the launch characteristics of shot put and help our athletes improve performance with knowledge from the results. So here we go. With the shot put, the distance is very important. That's the key thing that's measured in a competition. The radar technology measures the launch characteristics, and they include, of course, the distance of the throw, which is the most important factor. The things that go into that distance include the velocity of release, the angle of release, the direction of release, and the height of release. To be able to now wait three seconds, five seconds after a throw, and to know exactly all of those variables, and with five seconds later to watch the video of it just like that. Being able to see it right there on the spot and then knowing what I felt and what I think I did, but then see it, then to see the numbers with it, it makes a difference. So I can kind of make those small changes in my mind mentally, and I think it really helps me connect it. The biggest thing with the data is we keep it in the cloud. And by keeping it in the cloud, we're able to access that from all over the world at any time of the day, whether I was in Beijing at the 2015 World Championships and we're looking back at the practice I had here, I'm always able to go back and be accountable for what I did. And our coach and I can assess to where we need to go with the next practice. The technology consists of a radar unit and it sits about seven or eight feet behind the ring, looking at the athlete, looking at where the shot put is going. My favorite thing about using this data is I see my best throw of the day, and I go to my worst throw of the day. Having the data changes the coach and athlete um, interaction simply by being more precise. In the past, it was qualitative type suggestions like, oh, I think that was too flat, or oh, I think that was too steep, or that was too slow. Now we know that flat means 30 degrees, 32 degrees. The ideal is about 36 to 38 degrees of launch angle. But when you're looking for such small changes, when you get those additional variables of velocity especially, so you can kind of see how much power is actually there, you can, it gives you just one more element to look for and re that really helps you differentiate what made this throw better than the last one. You've got that data now that allows you to optimize exactly the type of feedback that a coach is going to give an athlete right there in the circle. And to be able for the athlete to make those neural connections, if you will, based on that feedback immediately after that kinesthetic feedback that they're already getting from their movement, you know, it, it's, it's really powerful. For me to continue training and to defend my title, I definitely need that constant support and more access to the technology. I'm getting older, so the more feedback that I get to work on the smaller things will definitely make a big difference at this point in my career. We've got a group of throwers right now, uh, both Americans and international, that are kind of approaching the world record. I think as we get closer and look at breaking that, it's definitely coming, going to come down to training smarter and using everything we have at our disposal to our advantage uh, to kind of hopefully go where, where no man's gone before. Three medals is great, and we're not trying to be greedy, but we have the talent in this country where we can achieve more. 
not only to get more, but to protect those metals that we did get, because the rest of the world, they're not gonna, they're not gonna slow down. They're not gonna stop. We gotta stay ahead of them. That was a, a good kind of base modeling of, of what um, people can expect in terms of how the data is used, how athletes are embracing it. Um, but Phil, I want you to give us some idea, especially with all the predictions being that when the Olympics are in Tokyo for 2020, that we will see data collection uh, with the combination of artificial intelligence used in a frequency in a way that we have not seen before in previous Olympics. Can you give us some idea of what the evolution has been in terms of data collection and artificial intelligence? Yeah, well, you saw in that video that we're out there at the training center. And by the way, the three athletes that you saw in that uh, particular video um, in Rio went gold and silver and gold. So Michelle took gold in the women's and Ryan took gold in the men's and Joe took silver. So we'd been using that particular technology at the training center for about four years. But one of the things that um, is difficult is what do you do with the data when you've got it? We upload it to Google Drive. And so they have to then go and have an account on Google Drive. They have to download it. It's way easier than it used to be with a USB stick or a DVD or a CD or that sort of thing but it's still not where we want it to be. What we like to have, and we're developing right now, is an athlete monitoring system. And what that means is that data will be fed up to the cloud, the, the uh, parameters and the values will be immediately calculated, put into tables and into text, and displayed to the athlete. They can go into their locker, if you like, and find out their throws from, from today. The next step, as far as AI is concerned, is to start sifting through all that mammoth amount of data, the big data, if you like, that we've had from the past four years that we're continually gathering to show what the trends are, to show what the key performance indicators are for performance and the key indicators for injury um, so that we can mitigate injury and we can improve performance. So I like to think of it as kind of a con continuum from capturing the data on the field, feeding it up to the cloud, doing all the analysis and the AI, and then feeding it back down to the coach and the athletes so they can implement what we've shown them and what they've learned. And that's the biggest thing. If we don't, if we leave it up there, if we don't implement it, then we've wasted our time. So we have to communicate with the athlete and the coach on how to make changes from what we've found. And that comes down now to simple drills, simple exercises and movement changes. Um, and that's key to making the improvements. Now, Lindsay, um, with your relationship with athletes, how have you been able to use, um, maybe not particularly radar technology, but how have you been able to use this technology and the intelligence you're able to see through data in how you guide and direct athletes? Sure. Um, well, so one of the major ways would be through sleep monitoring. So we monitor nighttime sleep and daytime naps. Um, to inform our understanding of an athlete's recovery process. So your nighttime sleep is your number one recovery opportunity. Athletes obviously supplement with daytime naps because they're often up early for training or traveling internationally quite a bit. Um, so right now we're using um, an interbeat interval conversion, which is a sort of a, a way to measure the heart rate in time and uh, using that data to understand sleep and sleep parameters and what's happening in the nervous system and so the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system during nighttime sleep. Um, and we're also collecting a lot of other variables like which time zone are you in the world? How long have you been there? What are your um, training efforts and your rate of perceived recovery? What do you have coming up? All, all these, some, some are subjective, some are objective variables and we're putting that into um, it's more of like an informed algorithm than, in, I, don't, I don't know if it's entirely AI, but um, to give a training readiness score. So how ready are you to push yourself today based on this um, big set of data that we have on you? Um, and then an athlete can take that and work with their coach to figure out what they're gonna do it, uh, today. It, it doesn't, obviously doesn't restrict someone from training, but it just gives another um, piece of information beyond the, like, yeah, coach, I feel good, put me in. Now, how do the athletes themselves, um, or what's been you guys' experience into how they respond to the data that they've been given? Are they a bit intimidated by it, or do they honestly see this as, as real help for them in advancing and furthering their careers? Sure, I mean, I can stick on the topic of sleep. So 
um, sleep, we're often blind to what happens in our nighttime sleep. It's hard to do, think about with consciousness something that happens in a state when you're not conscious, which is when you're sleeping. Uh, so to have objective parameters around that is really helpful. Like my most common consult is an athlete comes into my office and says, hey, I've, I heard you do some sleep monitoring. Yeah, you're interested. Okay, let, let, you know, let's give this a go. I say, well, you know, um, how, how long do you sleep on average? And I throw eight hours, because like this is the answer you're supposed to give. Okay, well, what time, what time do you get into bed? Ah, probably 11, 11.30. Did you use your phone? Yeah, I check Instagram before I go to bed. Okay, what time do you have to get up for training? Well, maybe 6.30. I'm like, okay, doing the math. 11.30 <laughs> 6.30, you know, we're not, we're not even at eight hours. Um, so to, to have information about what happened there, right? And so for an athlete to understand, like, I am in a heavy period, I am exhausted. My, they probably won't use this word, but it's in the sleep medicine literature, this non-restorative sometimes features of sleep that, that occur as you um, are coming from the threshold of functional overreaching, you're pushing yourself, it's working well, you feel terrible because this is what the training is designed to do, but sometimes you go too far and then you're in overtraining. But so we can, we can sort of see these things in sleep. So once an athlete understands that that's the value of um, that the data can provide, or it helps us understand that, yeah, when you hit the ground in Tokyo, there'll be so many days, and it's individualized, um, till your nervous system normalizes, and we can expect you to perform the same way that you perform in your in your home training environment. Um, that's that's powerful, because it's, it's hard to talk around these things, and you can get in your head to say, well, like, maybe, maybe I'm just like, not that motivated, or maybe I'm not working that hard, or what if my coach thinks that I'm trying to make excuses, and the objective data um, helps inform that story. Uh, now, Phil, how does this technology help in identifying skill sets for certain athletes? Well, yeah, getting back to that as, as far as the skill sets and, and the athletes and the coaches, the skill sets, we've been using it over the past four years for mostly the elite athletes, but it's going to trickle down for sure. Uh, right now, it's a little bit expensive. Um, and hopefully we're making video and the radar technology less and less expensive in the future so we can get it to our development athletes as well. But if I may, I'd like to also make a comment on the athletes and coaches acceptance oh, of, sure. this, of this technology. I think we have a difference. Um, the athletes are probably in the 20s to early 30s and the coaches are generally a bit older, maybe 40s, 50s, some of them 60s. And I think that that is a mirror into how they're accepting the technology. The younger generation is really into social media, their cell phone. So when we can give them a video that has multiple views, and that's also what the radar technology can do, there's built-in video. So we can give them some numbers so they can brag about it on Instagram or, and post a video of, yeah, I'm in my training session, this was my PB 21, 23, and, and look at the technique, and you've got a video there with three views all on the same video. That really is powerful for them. It's a powerful message, and it makes them feel good, and it makes them understand what's going on more. Now, I have a funny story as far as one of the coaches is concerned. Um, he was kind of a bit intimidated by the technology, and he wasn't sure that he really wanted it. I mean, he's like, well, I've, I'm, I know what I'm looking for. I've been doing this for years, the typical statement. Um, and so I had to kind of sugarcoat it a little bit from the point of view that, coach, you know, you actually get out there with a, with a tape measure and measure each one of those throws. This will do that for you. You won't have to run out there with a tape measure. And he was like, the light went on. I was like, oh, OK, so yeah, so let's give it a go. And then after a while, he would look over my shoulder, and he'd look at the velocity, and he'd like, that velocity, that's pretty important, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Oh, that angle, that kind of relates to how far it goes as well. And so within a few, literally a few weeks, it was all of a sudden, it was the, his best friend. And uh, I think that's, that's the way. It's, it's education. If we can educate them how this is going to help them, and it is going to make a positive difference to what they're doing, then they're all for it. Is there a fear among coaches that this data um, maybe will one counter to some of their coaching methods, but also maybe from a point of insecurity, they'll start thinking, oh, the robots have won. They'll, they'll soon be replaced. <laughs> yeah, we do get that. And there's a lot of intimidation between, between what if it shows something I'm telling them to do is not working or is, is wrong. And you've got one coach that's, that's fixed in their ways, and that's intimidating to them. But you've got the other coach who's like, well, if I am wrong, 
I really want to know about it because I really want to help my athlete. And so let's fix it. Let's find out what's going on. And as far as automating and taking their job away, no, I convince them that it's actually helping their job. It's making them more intelligent. It's a tool that they've just got to learn to use. And like I said, it's all about coaching education. If we can educate an athlete, we can help one athlete. If we can educate a coach, we can help 10 athletes. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to show the coaches how we can use this scientific technology, how it can help what they're already doing, and just augment it. Yeah, and, and um, not to forget the, the other question. Um, this is uh, some of the work that you're doing. Um, you're able to allow uh, athletes to really find out what their skill sets are and where they need to maybe work more at or work less at or just how to provide a more um, balanced training approach. Can you talk about that? Yes, well, that would be a good uh, introduction to an, another area that we use, which is called motion capture, motion analysis. The radar kind of gives us four or five values. It's more of what the outcome is, what's happened, how the shot put, and I'm using shot put as an example, but it can be applied to all different sports and different events. But we want to know what caused that. What did the body do to make that happen? And so now we need to go into an area called motion capture and motion analysis, and that allows us to measure how the body is moving and what it's doing. And as you say, what is the skill set? Where are they lacking? Are they too weak? Are they too slow? Are they not coordinated in their kinematic sequence? Are they not sequencing correctly? This is where motion capture, motion analysis is going to come in, uh, and that's something we can talk a little bit more about as we go. Are there particular sports, I mean, can either of you or both of you provide us with some examples where um, this technology is already being used, is helpful, because um, there are some sports more so than others that really seem to be embracing what this approach can do. Do you want me to go on that one? Or? Well, you can stick with, yeah, Raider stuff and I'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're using it across sports, and one of the things we do with the technology and innovation uh, group is we try to find projects that will be multi-sport relevant. So not just fixing shot put, but if we can do motion capture, motion analysis, then we can look at gymnastics, we can look at diving, we can look at uh, running, we can look at many, many different sports. And so this technology can help us keep, as I said, bring out the key performance indicators. So you wanted some examples. I mean, we could look at, uh, we've looked at long jump, for example. I, I work a lot with uh, track and field and the throwers and the jumpers. And so in jumping, uh, we're interested in how fast they're running, because that's a key performance indicator. We're interested in what their angle of takeoff is. So we're using this technology mostly with video. It's quite surprising how standard video is still used today. But we're trying to go to the next stage. We're trying to go to the intelligent video, which now brings in the use of AI, so that we can put that video on the side of the long jump run up and we can immediately give them the feedback of, oh, you need to change your angle by one degree and increase your speed by a tenth of a meter per second. So those are the sorts of things, the sorts of examples. We're using it in diving. Um, and I'm, again, I'm using in examples that I know of. If we can do it in diving and springboard diving and we can tell them the height of takeoff and the rate of spin and we can feed that back directly on the video, then the coach can say, aha, that's what's happening there. And I mean, for sleep monitoring, as an example, it's uh, all of our athletes, Olympic, Paralympic, summer, winter, everyone in this room, hopefully, is sleeping um, at night, <laughs> assuming we're all diurnal. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that's, I mean, it's, it's pretty widely uh, spread. There are other projects that seem to be more suited um, to specific sports. So uh, brainwave stimulation, for one, has, um, a pod of users, cyclists seem to be taking taking to it quite well because you, it's a headset that is worn and they can wear it on a trainer. Um, and there's some evidence that we're pretty excited about that um, suggests the stimulation to the motor strip changes the way that um, the brain communicates fatigue down to the muscles. Mm -hmm. um, so the muscles can communicate fatigue up, but then the brain can communicate fatigue down. Which so so this temporarily, I don't want to say disrupting, but temporarily delaying that process allows an athlete to push themselves slightly further than they were able to push themselves previously because they don't feel the same sensation of fatigue. So endurance sport athletes, in this example, specifically cyclists, um, 
seem to really like the uh, transcranial direct current stimulation. Now, do you find um, as well that there is, because uh, you know we know that there's a certain amount of machismo toughness that are built around every sport, and for a lot of athletes, rest is not in their vocabulary. Correct. So how do you combat that? This is a great question. Um, so usually with data, so there's uh, data suggesting that uh, we could randomly sample, pretend we're all football players or baseball players, we could randomly sample our own reports to how, um, how likely it would be, would be for us to fall asleep in certain circumstances. So this is a standardist, standardized ass sleepiness scale, where you, you literally just report on a scale one to three. How likely is it for you to fall asleep when you're sitting in a meeting, driving in a car, sitting as a passenger in a car, laying down in the afternoon? Um, and then you can track our performance across multiple years. And the higher, the more sleepiness that you report today, the um, less likely it is for you to be in the league years later. And, and not, not by an uh, insignificant amount. I, I can't remember the exact, the exact um, numbers, but it's something like a 40% spread across. Like, so let's say you, you, know, you have a very low sleepy value and I have a high sleepy value. You're, 40% more likely to be in the league in three seasons. So once athletes understand um, that like if you've signed up to, for your profession, if you're lucky enough, like genetically have access to coaching, you know, being able to invest yourself, uh, if you undermine your recovery, you're, I can't guarantee it, but I can say it with a lot of confidence, you are going to shorten your career. Mm. And it's something that's in your control. Also, I mean, other things are gonna happen, right? Like, you could get injured. I mean, who knows? You could get cut. But why not focus on something that's in your control and take advantage of it? So I hopefully can undermine your machismo by selling you on the idea of recovery. We'll have to talk after the panel about why I always fall asleep in cars, because I just can't figure. <laughs> my sleepiness scale is like super high in cars. I don't know why this is. And on planes. But yeah. That's uh, for another panel, one sure. of these days. Sure. Um, you know, what made most people, I think, um, especially fans in particular, I don't know if they have a real sense of what that good to great leap is and just how minuscule the margin for error really is, particularly at the Olympic level. How does all of this, um, from artificial intelligence to the data gathering uh, to the motion capture, how does this help to sort of reduce that margin of error, if you will? Well, I think that, as you mentioned, we're getting closer and closer. It's a thousandth of a second. It's a centimeter that wins a gold medal, and then you've got a silver medal because you were this much shorter. So I think it comes back down to the technology being able to measure what's going on, not, not in the competition, but in practice. So now we know for a fact what your um, key indicators are how you're doing at every training session. So we can plot those, and I, and I think that's the, the important point, is we can track these variables accurately, that's key, and over a period of time, so we can see where you're failing, where you're improving, and how to improve each one of those different parameters, because we're measuring them. Without measuring, you're just guessing. Yeah, and I'd say it's a, it's a combination of using sophisticated technology, and then it's a combination of um, maybe some unexciting ideas, like you know, spending adequate time in bed, showing up to training prepared every single session, and that's often multiple sessions in a day, with a clear agenda of what you want to address that day, um, communicating clearly with your coach about what's going on and what are the expectations, and being planful about how you're investing your resources. Um, yeah, like Phil said, I mean, the, the margins are so small. And then I, I think being, I mean, scientists on staff at the Olympic Committee and, and other National Olympic Committees or general sport organizations, I mean, we're like sort of surveying um, published literature and saying, okay, if, if you're seeing a 10% gain in this collegiate or the semi-pro population, like, what if it converted to a half a percent of a gain in our population? Like, it is worth paying attention to. Um, so we're... Yes, high tech, but also some of the um, lower tech things of just putting your shoes on the right feet in the morning. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that the tech helps us to look at 
the, the, as you say, the low tech, and it allows us to look at the differences between quality and quantity. I think that's really key now. We have to be very smart in the way we train. And so if we can have a much better quality workout, rather than just working five hours, work three hours and do a really good job of it, and the measurement and the recovery, that all allows us to, to be more mindful and to be more um, accurate in the way we do that. And I don't want to belabor the point, but you're saying mindful. So years ago, I was um, in Chula Vista at the training center there. Uh, working with the archery team, and we were doing mindfulness sessions after lunch. I also do this brainwave analysis to sort of understand the cortical patterns of, of, of what's happening in the outer layer of the brain and what's associated with, you know, sort of good shots and bad shots. So there were some athletes who um, were sort of in my line, like queued up to, you know, sort of be the next ones to sort of look at this. And you have to record a lot of shots to have some sort of degree in co of confidence in the recommendation that you're going to make to the athlete. But so, say, so like, so an athlete, for example, I'll call him Joe. Joe wants to do the brainwave analysis. Okay, Joe, you're falling asleep four out of five days per week after lunch during mindfulness. You're falling asleep, which is like, I'm just not even going to mention, uh, I'm, I'm not actually offended, you need the sleep, but like, you're not rested enough for us to do this more sophisticated thing of brainwave analysis and intervention, or even with the brainwave stimulation, with, with the halo headsets as an example. Um, if you are tired, there's, there's no amount of sort of fancy things we can do in the day with technology to give us the 1% when the, the tiredness and the sleepiness is going to undermine your, it's going to reduce your performance because it acts like a, a, a load on your nervous system. Mm -hmm. So I know it's less exciting to be spending more time in bed and getting more total sleep time at night. But um, you know, first things first, like, like, a, like a good coach won't let you make your progressions without great foundations and basics. Uh, let's, we're not going to go to the tip of the iceberg when we've got well, I'm not a dietitian, but if you have poor nutrition or you're, you're dehydrated, you're, you're not well rested, you, you showed up without the right gear, I mean, you, you're not going to become the best in the world with, with the missing foundation. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because there's always this um, tension and argument about athletes and resting, right? And a lot of it has to do with people knowing how much money some athletes make or what, what the, the skin they have in the game, and they have this idea that they should be, you know, going out there and just killing themselves all the time, and that's the only way that they can get better. And so this is providing kind of a, a almost a, a, a 180 look Precisely. at how different it is. It's not the more, you know, it's, it's not the more you exhaust yourself. It's actually the opposite, Precisely. right, in many respects. Look, yeah. there was a, there was a, very unscientific investigation by Zio, which was a sleep device that's no longer in business. But according to Zio, LeBron James and Roger Federer were spending 12 hours per 24-hour cycle in bed, asleep. And when you appreciate what they can do with their body and their brain when they are playing tennis and basketball, like you better believe they need 12 hours in bed. Mm. And I think we're looking now at the holistic approach, and you mentioned it, nutrition, and you mentioned sleep and recovery. What we do at the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee is we have a team of experts around each of the different sports. We have portfolios of sports, and we have high performance directors, and then we have nutritionists, we have sports psychologists, we have Lindsay's, the psychophysiology aspect of it, strength and conditioning, biomechanics, sport technology. We try to put a team of experts so we can help them in whatever it is that they're having problems with, not just trying to force our expertise because that's the only guy that's working with them. So if it's, if it's a hammer, then it's going to be a nail. If, if I'm a biomechanist, it's going to be motion analysis. So no, we, we work as a team and we discuss the athletes every couple of weeks We've got what they're doing in nutrition. We've got what they're doing in sleep. We've got what they're doing in technique. And we've got red, greens, and blues on each one of them. Uh, blue. Red, greens, and, and yellows on each one of them. And we have discussions about them to find out which aspect it is that we need to help, that they need help in. Yeah, and I just want to give everybody a warning. Probably in about 10 minutes, uh, we're going to open the floor for questions. So if you have any, have those. 
um, ready and we'll have somebody with a microphone that'll come around and get those from you. Uh, but before we get to that part, one of the coaches in the video um, about the radio technology said, you know, we have to do this if we want to keep up with the rest of the world. So when it comes to embracing and using this technology, where, I mean, I don't expect you to maybe not you know, know an exact ranking per se, but, but how are we doing in this area compared to what other countries and how they're developing and using technology with their athletes? I think before Rio, we had kind of a wake-up call. The Brits were doing a lot with because they've been funded through lottery funds. The Germans were doing a huge amount. Australian Institute of Sport had really helped Australia. And, and we really wanted to get on the map and start uh, not only keeping up, but surpassing and using the technology in, in thoughtful ways. Um, so we put together a technology and innovation fund with uh, some high-powered um, gentlemen from Silicon Valley. Um, they put together the fund, they put their money where their mouths are, and actually started funding projects. And that's been going on for about four, four years now, and it is really starting to make a difference. We have the high performance directors from each of the national governing bodies of the sports put in their project to our high performance director, and then it gets submitted, and we, we basically go through, rank them, and come out with the best ones. Um, and the best ones, of course, are going to be the ones that are multi-sport, that are very basic to all different sports, like the sleep and recovery, like the athlete management system, like the motion capture, motion analysis. Because once you've uh, developed one of these for one sport, you can pr very quickly bring it across to the other sports. And that's going to help us um, improve our technology much more rapidly. Um, for most fans who watch the Olympics, or really mo any sport, uh, it's an emotional experience. Um, I think a lot of fans would like to, to believe that most of these athletes, they were successful um, just purely based off God-given ability and some lightning bolt struck them out of somewhere. And next thing you know, they were Usain Bolt. As you guys know, that's not quite the way that it works. But why should fans be interested um, in this kind of tech and where it's taking um, our Olympic programs, Olympic teams, and Olympic, Olympic athletes? Well, I think that, that in this day and age, with technology everywhere, and with cell phones and smartphones everywhere, we're just seeing more and more graphics, we're seeing more and more information. And I think now they want to know ju not just the stats of the, the game or the match, but they want to know the stats of each athlete. And the, stats, the, the statisticians are looking for more and more information. And so I think that I've seen it much more in the last few months on television. I know on the Golf Channel, when you're watching the golf now, you can see how much hip turn was in the backswing. What was the velocity of the board? You can ball. You can see the trajectory of the ball. But they're getting into more and more of the body. And I just saw one the other day uh, on baseball where it was giving the spin of the ball and the trajectory of the ball. I think it just adds to the excitement and the the interest level of each of the sports. I think maybe as, as a fan or a viewer, it helps, again, like quantify, like what is it that makes that so appealing to me? Like, like that is marvelous to why, you know, and it, it maybe it anchors it into some sort of number. I mean, hopefully people can still have like sort of the aesthetic experience mm -hmm. and like soak it up. I, I think, um, so why do fans care? Hopefully there would be a trickle down effect of um, high quality, valid, reliable, you know, these, as, as an example, I mean, there's probably at least half the audience here who has some type of sleep tracker, you've sort of tried to measure your sleep at night, maybe it's on your phone, the accelerometer, your phone gets stuck underneath the pillow, it thinks you're asleep, you went to the bath, you know, there's, um, there are uh, different ways of, um, of, of measuring things, I mean, like, measuring core body temperature when you're in endurance sport and exposed to sun and, and, and heat and humidity. I mean, that matters a lot. And, and there's little temperature pills you can take and monitor, monitor things. So, so hopefully, as Phil said, I mean, radar technology ex is expensive, uh, sleep technology less so, but hopefully to the, um, to the person sitting at home next summer watching the Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, hopefully they'll be the beneficiary of um, the, the committee's efforts to sort of track down um, the most impactful tools, technological tools, and um, whether you're a weekend warrior, at, you know, or whatever it is, that, that you could somehow benefit from this too, and, 
in your, in this case, athletic endeavors. I've got one immediate example that just comes to mind of how the weekend warrior is now starting to benefit from this technology. And it's really in line with the technology that I've talk, been talking about. It's not just the radar, but it's the video. Now, with the video, we use multiple cameras from multiple angles, and those have to be synchronized with one another. So you can just flip on the iPad from one view to the next view, and it's at the same point in the skill. So if it's the, the ball is just being launched, or the, the, the ball has hit the tennis racket, and, or the athlete has just jumped off the ground, you want to be able to flip through that. One of the companies out there has just come out with that now on the iPhone. So basically, if you've got three friends who have three iPhones and you've got an, uh, an iPad, you can just set those three iPhones on a tripod around whatever it is, whether golf swing, baseball swing, whatever, and it transmits them directly to the iPad. And it's an app. So this technology was at the Olympic training center level, and now it's come down to everybody. So I think that's pretty cool that we're all going to benefit from it in the future. What I don't like, though, and what I'd like to see improved are the programs, the goals that are set, like 10,000 steps. I have a problem with that. I mean, everybody's not going to do 10,000 steps. Let's get to the point where we're specifically designing the program for you. And so we can do an assessment on you, and then we can design your program, and then we can measure it in, again, I keep using the word thoughtful manner. Uh, that's what I'd like to see in the future, not just shotgunning all this technology out there. Technology is useless if it's not used in the correct manner. Well, this uh, wedding dress I have to fit into says I need 10,000 steps a day, but that's all good. <laughs> but so to the extent that that motivates you to take 500 more steps in your day, you just keep that in your mind, yeah. right? It's like your little behavioral guidepost. Look, uh, Dr. But, Lindsay, we got to work on my sleep. That, that's first. <laughs> okay. And then we'll get to the Sleep and metabolism. Steps. I mean, there's so many. There was just this great sleep conference, um, <laughs> time-restricted eating. Yeah, there's, there's so many things, and we're going to start looking into a, is there a way that athletes can time their meals that will help facilitate um, jet lag adaptation. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many exciting things um, in the sleep world, but in other ways that we can look again at the, these behaviors that we're going to do anyways, hopefully, um, how, how can we reprioritize them or how can we reinforce certain behaviors and um, sort of steer people away from other behaviors? Like if, if, if you understood the impact of consuming one alcoholic beverage at this time versus many across this amount of time, if you understood the impact on your nighttime sleep, and if there was a metric around that, that could really drive your, your behavior. With athletes, I'll often say, like, you want to socialize, right? You're 18 to usually 35 years old with the athletes that I work with. Um, you should socialize because they're social beings, and we'll, we'll knit. So I had a, a rock climber recently. If you didn't know this, rock climbing will be in the Tokyo Games. I had a rock climber say to me, my friends like to party. I say, okay, well, this is good. Um, well, like, define party. He's like, well, we stay up all night. Said, okay, what is all night? We don't go to bed till probably sunrise. I go, okay, how, how many times are you doing this in a month? I don't know, like five, six. Okay, well, let, let's put a metric on that. I, I'm not your mother. I can't tell you that you can't do this. But if you understood how this impacted your ability to be planful the next day, sustain your attention, be vigilant to the routes. I mean, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a great climber, so I don't understand all the exact demands that, that the athlete encounters. But if, if you understood the impact, the, the um, cumulative impact of that type of sleep restriction, um, I bet you'd make a different choice, mm -hmm. or at least you, at least you could make an informed choice next right. month. Maybe it goes from five times to two. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> could be, that be an idea? Yeah. I think the cool thing about all this work that we're doing at the Olympic Committee now and the Paralympic Committee is that our goal is to bring it down to the consumer level. That's one of the new edicts that we've got, is all of the information that we learn for the elite athlete has application for the weekend warrior and just general health and fitness. And I think that that's one of the things that we're trying to progress to in the next few years is to help the USA population in general. Um, we're going to open the floor for questions. So raise your hand if you, there's one back there. Hi. I was wondering if you, if, if the USOC or any other countries are getting pushback from the International Olympic Committee about any of this technology 
potentially deeming it unfair and therefore banning it? Not so much. No, it's, it's interesting you ask that because we have um, sponsors who are helping us work on technology such as Intel and Comcast and several others, um, but they're also IOC sponsors as well. So they're actually implementing technology projects at the IOC level as well as at the USOC level. To follow up on that, are there any are there any ethical concerns that people have about how this technology and data is used? Yeah, I mean, so, so the example that I gave before, brainwave stimulation, um, direct current stimulation, uh, there, there's been um, a pondering in the literature whether or not it, is, it could be considered a performance enhancing drug. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the thought um, the thought project is is sort of lagging behind the way technology is interfacing with athletes. So, so in that case, I I doubt much will happen. But yeah, I think there is um, there are you know a, appropriate concerns. Um, I'm I'm not my my personal opinion is that I'm I'm not concerned about um, DC STEM conferring an unfair advantage. Um, the the cost of the, te the technology is is quite low. I mean certainly there are versions of headsets that are very expensive, but it, the technology in and of itself has been used for decades, um, and, it, and it's quite inexpensive. So, but it, but it, it, is, it, it is an interesting sort of um, dilemma to consider. Could this um, uh, eventually, uh, and maybe even currently, but could this eventually have a real significant impact on the longevity of athletes? Like how long we're used to, especially in Olympic sports, seeing them retire at an age that to the rest of this pop, the rest of the population is like that's very young. But if you're a gymnast and you're 30, that's not happening, right? So could this really impact their longevity? And I, I would I would hope that if you uh, I mean so so there were biological limitations, you know, for example, in gymnastics and figure skating, I don't know, perhaps diving. That, no, that's not to say that there haven't I would say recently been older athletes. You know, what is considered to be an early specialization sport, but. Um, one of the one of the approaches we are taking is how do we prolong the the careers of these highly successful athletes? So if you were very successful, or if you were a four to eighth place finisher in Rio in the last games, I mean, what is it? Is there something that needs to be addressed to enhance your performance? And how do we invest in your in your recovery um, to get you to 2020? Assuming that's something you want to do and you can prioritize your life around that. But um, I think that um, the way we think about um, how our bodies are aging or, or breaking down at the most elite level in sport. I mean, I've just in, I just can, I can think of a of a handful of athletes who did very well in Rio that thought seriously about retiring, and then you know, I, I'm in the best shape of my life. There's no reason other than sort of this, you know, this idea, this this certain number, this age in in my mind for my sport. I'm considered old, but. I'm one of the best, and when you put wisdom with a with a well maintained body, it's, I think it's hard to beat. I can give you a specific example of that, and and how technology can really help. And and again, I get back to the gymnastics example and workload monitoring or training load monitoring. If we can use AI to turn that video camera that's trained on the parallel bars, trained on the rings, trained on the high bar in the gym, in their workout gym, if we can now take that video and feed it through an AI, AI algorithm that can count the number of skills they can do, can log the type of skill, can log the quality of skill, can put it into their logbook, which now, instead of just being a piece of paper in a book, is now in the athlete monitoring system. And we're doing this already, by the way. Now you can start, in, in a limited sense, now you can start looking at how they're being affected by the amount of work they're doing. You can start periodizing their workouts so you can back off. You can load heavier, you can load lighter, you can, you can cut back, you can taper. All of these things can help the athlete do better in a competition, but remain healthy. If the athlete's not in the competition, he can't win it or she can't win it. So if we can uh, monitor their training and workload in a, in a very skillful manner, then I think the longevity thing comes along with it. 
again, we have a couple more minutes for questions. Mr. Tinsley. <laughs> Uh, just with the, the data that you all collect, I can see that um, being really useful, like outside of sports. How have you noticed the, the feedback from the medical community, or even something like military? Because I can see like Navy SEALs using this type of information to really help them as well. Have you noticed outside uh, fields? You got something on that? I mean, I'll, I can talk a little bit about sleep, but if, if there's something about Centers. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we have interaction, especially in San Diego at the Olympic Training Center, we've had interaction with the Navy SEALs, and I think we do share a lot of information back and forth as to what's working for them, and you know, when you've got the crazy elite athlete and the, and the uh, military person, they're working at the same sort of level, so yeah, there is feedback going back and forth, and we've got several perform human performance seminars where the military guys give us their information and we talk about what we're doing. So I think that, yeah, it goes both ways. Um, I'll, I'll, I just want to give one really great example of that. So we have different uh, vulnerabilities to sleep loss as an example. Um, so the, the, there's this, this task called a psychomotor vigilance task, which is a very boring task where you sit there for usually about 20 minutes and you just continue to respond to something on the screen and it, you know, the, the software counts your reaction time, your reaction time variability, things that you missed, times you press the button when you shouldn't have all these things that have world, a, a real world translation to um, like military style tasks. But um, so there is, so we, don't, we don't have a good understanding of the exact genetics that gives this ability that sort of um, buffers you from the cognitive cost of sleep loss. But if we know that about you, or if there's a way that we can detect that, those are the wildfire firefighters that you deploy first when you know they're tired, right? Because you know they're gonna be less likely to make a mistake. Or those are the astronauts that you send up on some sort of exploration mission. Or those are the people that you, you keep on a longer shift compared to maybe someone who's more vulnerable um, to, to the costs of something like sleep loss. So, we're, I mean, at least when I'm working with athletes, I'm, I'm borrowing heavily from these other high performance literature, uh, you know, astronauts, soldiers, what's published, that sort of stuff. Yeah, and real quick, quickly along those same lines, um, it feels like in the American professional sports community, like basketball and the NBA, mm -hmm. they have really, you know, adopted a lot of technology. Uh, you know, they got a team like Golden State, like for a long time was kind of really in the driver's seat as far as that kind of conversation. Are you also sharing a lot of information, not with just the NBA community, but with like the NFL? Is there a cross sharing of information with the professional sports leagues in America about the technology that you have and even from a sleep standpoint, what you're discovering uh, in the, at the Olympic level? That's one of the things that I'm kind of embarking on at the moment with the, the technology committee and the technology group at the Olympic Training Center. We have some of the members on there that are in professional sports as well. And so, yes, we are trying to pick their brains. And when we see at conferences stuff that's in basketball, stuff that's in baseball, we definitely share. And I think we get quite a, quite a level of sharing. I mean, it goes only so far and then it stops and says, well, we're not going to tell you any more, but at least we can find the products that they're using and the sorts of technology that are going in that direction. So I think that that's one of the goals to try and uh, access those experts because there's so many experts in the professional fields. Yeah, and even they just have like clever approaches. Like, so there was this one study that was published about um, the incidence of late night tweeting and then subsequent, uh, you know, next day game performance, which was just, <laughs> that was so clever, right? It's public information. If you are tweeting, you're not asleep unless you've got someone else tweeting. You know, but like, there, there's often these great ideas that come up, like, yes, okay, we, you know, we could sort of borrow or steal um, with these clever ideas. Definitely. Well, thank you all for being exceptionally clever on this panel. Um, a round of applause for uh, our experts here, for Phil and Lindsay.